You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 160. This week I would like to thank everyone who has chosen to review this podcast on iTunes or wherever they get their podcasts from. Reviews are a great way to help the podcast because it helps us find more listeners, which is always nice. So if you've left a review for the podcast, thank you. And if you haven't, now's your chance. For almost four years, the Western Front had been mostly static, but all of that was about to change. For almost four years, both sides had been throwing themselves at the other without much success, but Operation Michael, with the Germans, would finally change the map in a drastic way. To do this, they had gathered over 6,500 artillery pieces and over 3,000 minenwerfers. They also had assembled a massive superiority of men and in the air. This would be the great moment, the beginning of the Kaiserschlacht, hopefully the beginning of the end of the war. The only question would be, would it be successful? If it was, how much would the Germans gain? In the darkness before the infantry assault began, final orders were issued all along the front. On the British side, they prepared for the coming attack. Here is Private F. Plumer of the 24th Machine Gun Battalion. Quote, we set about getting as much ammunition as possible, handy, around us. Filling all of our spare belts, getting extra cans of water for cooling the machine guns, putting out bits of camouflage, and generally speaking, getting ready. Personally, I wondered what it would be like. I think I imagined that the Germans would stumble unwittingly up to our guns, and that we would shoot them all down and then resume our previous pattern of life. I felt that nothing would hit me. I felt I was fireproof. End quote. On the German side, men prepared to move forward, like Lieutenant Ringhold Spingler of the 1st Bavarian Division, who was in high spirits. Quote, this display of military power made us hope that the long, depressing years of war would soon come to a swift and victorious end. Perhaps now we would have the upper hand. All along the front, the German pioneer units had crawled out between the lines. Their goal was to make sure that the wire was cut so that the assault troops could pass quickly through. Graffiter Paul Kreschmer was among these men. Quote, then we reached the barbed wire, our objective, but there was nothing for us to do. The wire was completely destroyed. There wasn't really any trench left, just craters and craters. Now I looked back the way we had come and saw a swarm of men following. I couldn't stop a lump coming to my throat. Only a few of the enemy had survived the storm. Some were wounded. They stood with hands up. There was no need to tell them. They got the message to the rear. As the first assault troops moved through, many would encounter almost no resistance in the first trenches. Fusilier Waldmer Schlemau of the 5th Guard Grenadier Regiment discussed his experience in the first few waves of the German troops. Quote, I saw my first Englishman, dead, headless, in the British trench. In my mind, I saw a map of England and Ireland, and I thought that somewhere there would be sadness. We had not been fired upon at all, and our first realization that we had reached the British front line was the sight of this dead man. We could hardly realize that this had once been a trench. It was difficult to see the line of it. It had been so heavily shelled by our artillery, and very hard, and yet most welcome. Then it was time for us to get on again. This was not atypical. Many German troops would not see any British soldiers for hours, and those that did usually did not find them in any mood to fight. Here is Lieutenant W.B. Scott of the 6th Somerset Light Infantry, who would be one of the British soldiers near the front when the attack began. Quote, it was very foggy, and I heard no firing at all. 
If I had been more experienced, I would have known that what was happening, but the first I knew that the Germans had attacked at all was when I went around the traverse of the trench and walked into this horrible little German with thick glasses on. It was the first German I had ever seen. He put his bayonet at the center of my stomach and said, Comrade, yes or no? I said yes. As they progressed forward, the German troops were still cloaked in a heavy fog, which caused many units to get lost, but it also made it difficult for the British to coordinate their defense. There were units that did manage to mount some resistance, but they were usually not very successful. Gunner Walter Lug would be behind the front, but would soon find himself near the front lines and preparing to leave. Quote, the chaps who weren't handling the guns lay out with rifles to hold off the Jerry's when we stopped firing. I was handling one of the guns, so I had to help to get the breech block out, take the number seven sights away. Most of us managed to get back all right, creeping away in runs or twos. Behind the front, officers were slow to begin to react. Here is Private Alex Jameson of the 9th Division, who would be part of some reinforcements pushed forward in the early hours of the attack to try and stem the tide. He would not find much to work with, in terms of defenses. Quote, we were right out in the open, and we were told to lie down on some slightly raised ground and to make some sort of protection by digging in with our entrenching tools. Well, an entrenching tool is completely useless as a piece of equipment, unless it is meant to protect the base of your spine when it's hanging from your belt. But it only added to the weight and we had to carry when we were on the move. The small pile of earth I managed to throw up was absolutely laughable. While the frontline positions were falling, the German assault troops continued to push forward. They would next run into the main positions of the forward zone. These positions were much more heavily manned and armed when compared with the front lines, as they were designed with the purpose of slowing down any German attack. There were good solid positions with heavy machine guns, trench mortars, and even some 18-pounder field guns designed to work as anti-tank guns. Here the fog once again helped the Germans, even if it did cause some disorganization in their units. They handled this disorganization gracefully, and when units collided, their leaders would get together, determine roughly where they were, and then move off in opposite directions. The designed flexibility of the German tactics became a real asset in this kind of environment, since individual units were expecting and trained to work alone without clear information about the situation around them. Overall, they just kept moving forward. It's probably important to say at this point that while I'm describing the events of March 21st, it needs to be said that while we can tell a pretty coherent story about what was happening on the ground on that day, events were anything but coherent through the people actually involved. Officers and men, even those close to the front, had no idea what was happening. There was little ability to communicate what was happening to the left or to the right, and getting good solid information from the front to the rear was almost impossible. This meant that most of the fighting was small, desperate actions by small units with no clear picture of the wider events. As the German assault troops pushed forward, they were running into stronger positions, and in some cases barbed wire that was still intact. What they found in front of them was a series of redoubts, and they tried to push between them. This would allow the attack to continue while follow-on units would deal with the British redoubts. These strong British positions would have worked well against more traditional offensives, but since the Germans were planning to push past strong points anyway, it played right into their hands. By concentrating the defense in nice, small, compact areas, the British allowed themselves to be easily cut off. Sure, some of the defense of the Verdouts would last for the rest of the day, but by that point they were fighting German units who were not even supposed to be trying to push forward anyway. Here is Private G. H. Leadham of the 1st Leicesters. Quote, to tell you the truth, I didn't want to die, but I thought we were going to. I didn't think we were going to see the sunset, but I remember thinking that whatever they did to us, and we had at least earned our bob that day. Mind you, we had no fancy ideas about fighting to the last man. And here is Private J. Parkinson of the 16th Machine Gun Battalion. Quote, we were in action for some time, and I think we hit many Germans. Then it went quiet, and I thought that we had stopped them. I was loading another belt into the gun when I felt a bump on my back. I turned around and there was a German officer with a revolver in my back. Come along, Tommy. You've had enough. I turned around then and said, thank you very much, sir. I know what I would have done if I had held up my, by a machine gunner and I had that revolver in my hand. I'd have finished him off. But he must have been a real gentleman. It was 20 minutes past 10. I know the minute because I looked at my watch. <laughs> 
As the German battle units moved up and began really trying to take the redoubts, they often found them strongly held and they were forced to wait for heavier weapons to be brought forward before making their final assaults. Inside the redoubts, each officer in charge had to make decisions about when and if to retreat. There were officers at the front who could have ordered the retreats, but they were supposed to wait for orders from their brigade commander before ordering such a movement. In many cases, these brigade commanders never even really knew what was happening. Here is Captain H. H. Davies, a brigade intelligence officer, explaining the confusion. Quote, the battalions normally sent in situation reports before breakfast, but we had heard nothing that morning. We stood around Brigade HQ in a sunken road. It was foggy and noisy, and we had no idea what was happening. We had a little conference, and the brigadier decided that someone ought to go up to the front, see what was happening, and report back. I, as intelligence officer, was chosen to go. I and my groom set off on horseback. I don't know how we ever got there. I had a wonderful horse, and he cleared barbed wire and empty trenches. He was taking me. I wasn't taking him, but we never saw a soul. By the time brigade commanders found out what was happening, retreat was often already impossible because the surviving forward positions were already surrounded. The retreats that did happen were often due to small units just deciding that, hey, we've put up enough of a fight, it's time to go. These units often put up heavy resistance before re deciding to retire, and by that point the only available options were either surrender or die. It would take the Germans another hour and a half for most of the positions in the forward zone to fall to their attacks, and by midday there were only a few redoubts still holding out. One area that was holding out quite well was the most forward British positions inside the Flesquare salient. The salient was the point in the line that had been created by the Battle of Cambrai near the end of 1917, and instead of attacking this area, the Germans had decided early on that they would just bypass it. They would instead focus on attacking to the north and south of the salient, and then attempt to encircle it and cut off the troops inside. Throughout the entire 11-mile front line of the salient, the Germans launched some small attacks, and the British troops manning the line thought they'd done quite well. What they could not have known is that the attacks on the salient were just a bluff, and the Germans just wanted to make sure that the defenders thought that they were doing really good, and did not instantly start to retreat. At that very moment, troops were already beginning to move south from the north side and north from the south side to cut off the salient. If they were able to surround the troops inside, the British would have three entire divisions cut off, and it would be a disaster even on a day of disasters. Throughout the morning, Goff and the other British officers behind the front found themselves without much information. They knew that something was happening on the front lines and that the Germans were attacking, but that was about it. While the situation was confusing at the front, it was impossible to get any really solid information about what was happening. All that Goff and his staff could do was wait and put a few plans in place to make sure as many fighting units as possible were ready for action at a moment's notice. His staff even finalized plans to make fighting units out of any soldiers in replacement depots and administrative units, which was a good call, they would all be needed. Further back from the front, Haig was doing much the same thing as Goff. It is interesting to think about, but as much experience as the British Army leadership had in the war at this point, they would have very little experience on the defensive. Haig had not commanded a defensive battle since the retreat from Mons in 1914. This put them all in a different situation. It would be confusion that would not sort itself out for hours as reports, sometimes totally contradicting each other, began to trickle back from the front. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash gw50 
and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. For the German officers behind the front, the situation was a bit simpler. Just keep pushing troops forward and trusting those already sent to keep moving. Behind the forward units, there were hundreds of thousands of men who were pushing forward, and the entire landscape was one of movement. This would have been the perfect time for British artillery to drop a barrage on these troops, but they were too busy either displacing to keep ahead of the attack or fighting for their lives. This allowed the masses of German infantry that would be essential to keep the attack going to move forward unmolested. Here is Unterofficer Werner Erbach of the 126th Regiment with his experience from within this mass of men. Quote, the scene was one of movement, not of noise. The whole front was in motion, all going one way. It was a silent march, just the occasional order to stop and lie down or move on again. We heard no shooting. Where was the British artillery? Our artillery was silent too because they had started to move forward also. Our infantry ahead didn't seem to be fighting at all either. We didn't speak much. The exertion was just too much. We thought that the English had withdrawn and concentrated all their reserves well back. We kept asking where the English were, but no one knew. We believed that we had at least broken right through the English front, and that the moment we had all awaited all through the war had arrived. Now we could finish it off. It was a thrilling moment. Along the rest of the front, the German attack was now coming up to the main battle zone, the first line of which was called the Red Line. They reached these defenses around noon, although there's a huge variance on the specific time. At these positions, the Germans would run up against the strongest fortifications they would face in the attack, with a strong continuous set of trench lines, barbed wire, heavy machine guns, and good fields of fire. The battle zone had been constructed about 4,000 yards behind the forward zone, which is a lot of ground to cover. There were a good number of infantry positions, machine guns, and artillery positions, which would lay down fire on the German advance. Roughly half of the total British infantry were stationed in these defensive positions. To compound all of these problems, the Germans were also moving away from their artillery, which was even at that moment beginning to move forward to continue to supply the attack with fire. The final problem for the Germans was that the fog that had been so useful to them early on was finally starting to burn off, which made them more vulnerable to British fire. Due to all of these reasons, the fight over the battle zone would take longer than the previous positions, with the fighting continuing for a good portion of the afternoon along most of the front and into the evening in some areas. The War Diary of the British 30th Division would say this of the division's actions in the battle zone. Quote, 24 machine guns were posted at the battle zone. Teams were provided with deep dugouts or they fired from shafts. The guns came into action with great effect, breaking attack after attack. The Germans came to a standstill in the evening and the majority broke and ran to the cover of the slopes to the rear. A query to the northeast proved a fatal attraction. At one time, a thousand men were in and around it. The machine guns ripped through them with fatal effect, all guns firing at full rate. Two guns here fired 35,000 rounds, another 12,000, and a fourth a little less. While many British accounts are negative about what was happening at this point in the battle, not all were. And much like the account we just heard, here is Sergeant W. Donahue of the 478th Field Company with another reasonably positive account. Quote, While it was still misty, a German attack was made on our trench, led by an officer with a revolver. He was mounted on a horse and waving his men on. After two years of trench warfare with rarely a chance to see a German, let alone fire at one, this was an opportunity too good to miss. So I took careful aim and squeezed the trigger and had the satisfaction of seeing him fall from his horse, which then turned back and galloped off into the mist, followed by his men at a double. As my section were all also firing at the same time, I cannot be certain that it was my bullet which brought about the end of the attack. 
In a curious way, I quite enjoyed the battle. I expect it was because I had not previously been in a position to engage the enemy at close quarters, and at my age, then 22, I was thoroughly enjoying myself with no thought of the consequences. I think the same could be said of most of my comrades. While the fighting was desperate, the British were soon under pressure all along the front as fresh German divisions continued to pour into the fight. Everywhere was a mass of confusion as some German units began to finally make their way through while small British units mounted small counterattacks. In some places the British defenders held out for a time, only to then be surrounded due to the successes of the Germans on either side. All along the front the British artillery soon found themselves in a risky situation. Some batteries who had already been pulled back, but there were some who were still near the fighting. In many cases, they were forced to engage advancing German troops over open sites, something they had not done since the early days of 1914. Here is Sergeant J. Sellers describing the desperate defense of one of the guns. Quote, all available rifles were collected and all ranks ordered to take cover behind the roofs of the gun pits, signal shelter, etc. The number one of gun crews were instructed to remove the dial sight from abandoned guns. My limber gunner went, went one better and took off the dial sight carrier as well. Nobody was going to use my gun with any accuracy. The number of rounds we'd fired made a new calibration necessary anyway. Then we were given instructions to make a run for it to a trench line some 100 to 200 yards behind through a gap in the wire which was almost surrounded our position. We were on no account to stop to pick up casualties. This proved to be a wise order, but it was heartbreaking to leave some several good men hit, mostly in legs and feet, by machine guns trained on the gap in the wire. By late afternoon, in many areas along the front, the British were forced to retreat. This would not be an organized withdrawal, but a true retreat. Maybe not a rout, but at least a mildly organized retreat, even if the British didn't like to call it that. Here is Martin Middlebrook from the Kaiser's Battle. Quote, a study of official British reports, often compiled when officers returned from German prisoner camps after the war, all too often reveals references to German scene coming from the flank because the neighboring unit had either surrendered or fallen back without sufficient cause. Personal accounts written more recently often echo the same theme, although it's rarely the writer's own battalion that is blamed for failing to hold. Another unit to the right or left always gets the blame. The effect of such retreats was that, right from the beginning of this battle, there developed an attitude of uncertainty about flanks, a tendency for men in good defensive positions to be looking over their shoulders and wondering if they too ought not be moving back. Operation Michael would sometimes be called the March Retreat for a very good reason. While many troops were beginning to pull back, there were still some redoubts holding out in the forward zones. By this point, the officers in those redoubts assumed that there was very little chance of relief. Theoretically, the battle zone was supposed to stop the Germans, and then they would send a relieving force, but that seemed unlikely to those in the redoubts. Even those officers behind the front realized that something had to be done, and so orders began to be given out all along the front for those redoubts still being held to begin to make their way back after dark. Brigadier Major Harold Howitt would describe what it was like communicating with the redoubt in his sector. Quote, the last message I received was, We are surrounded now, sir. What shall we do? It was an agonizing position, so I rang the divisional commander and, as the whole front had collapsed, I was told to give them permission to cut their way out if they could. It was five o'clock before I was able to get back to them, and after that I heard no more. Many redoubts never received these orders and were often forced to surrender once their ammunition ran out. All along the front, thousands of British troops would give themselves up. Captain Davies, the brigade intelligence officer, would find himself in one of these positions. Quote, I went up to the front line then. It was an old German Hindenburg line, and I spent the next few hours helping to carry wounded and dead down into the palatial dugouts that the Germans had built. The slaughter had been terrific, all caused by shellfire. By afternoon, the weather was fine. The fog had lifted and we were waiting for something to happen, perhaps the Germans to attack from the front, or our own supporting troops to come up from the rear. While we were looking to the rear with our field glasses, watching some troops approaching, thinking it was our support, we saw to our astonishment that they were Germans, coming quite steadily in the open towards us. Those of our men who could do anything were getting fewer and fewer. We had been under shell fire all the time. So we collected all of the arms we could, mostly Mills bombs, and concentrated ourselves into what we called a strong point in those days, so that we could make a last bid for it. 
We held on for almost two hours. The Germans simply surrounded us and outnumbered us, and when all of our bombs and ammunition was gone, we could do no more. Other men would be even more surprised, like Corporal Ted Gale of the 14th Division. Quote, We got a brew going, but we hadn't been in the dugout for more than about 10 minutes when the captain popped his head in the dugout door. He said, You can all come up. You won't want your rifles. He said it quite calm-like. Anyway, we, were, we came walking out the dugout steps, and there was all these Jerry's around us. Of course, we realized what had happened. Jerry had broken through on the right and left of us. This was a mopping-up party coming. They never attempted a frontal attack. That was the strategy, you see. They went through on the right and left. For the German troops still moving forward, seeing the British prisoners being moved back behind the front was an eye-opening sight. Lieutenant Reinhold Spengler of the 1st Bavarian Division would see one such party of prisoners. Quote, After 500 meters, a group of figures wearing flat steel helmets appeared in front of us through the fog. At first, we did not know who they were, but soon they proved to be Englishmen. They carried no weapons and had raised their arms in the air as a sign of surrender. Coming closer, I could see by the expression on their faces that they had experienced a terrifying time during the last hours of the bombardment. So to summarize, March 21st had been a very bad day for the British, but join me next episode to find out how they are about to get much worse.